I do have I do have one one topic. So this goes back a couple years. I think we were doing a tour of Mm -hmm. the Andretti facility, and uh, I had the girls with me. And I don't recall how this came up. Somehow, a conversation between you and them uh, was chicken tenders, or sorry, chicken tendies, or chicken nuggets. And they got in this this debate of which which was better. Which was better? Yeah. yeah it's funny. I actually, I have this picture. Hang on. Last night I wore. I have this shirt. Um, I had this shirt that I wear, and uh, a buddy of my my co driver's wife got it for me actually for Christmas last year, and that was me at the having dinner last night. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I. Uh, it's like, so it's tenders. So chicken tendies, is, well, tenders or tenders is, is what you're after. So, so what happened is with that, there's always a story for everything, and it gets. But I was, I have a my engineer when I started driving the McLaren. Every night we'd go out to dinner, and I always get, I always got chicken, t- mm-hmm. chicken tenders, basically everywhere we went. And I didn't even notice it. It was just when you're racing on the weekends, it's not, you want something you can eat. You want yeah. it's you you don't you it's you go to all these odd places. You can't mess up chicken chicken tenders like you just yeah. you cut them, you put them in the fryer, you make sure they're done. You bring them out to me. It's not like getting a steak where you can get them all kinds of different. It's it's simple. Yep. It's easy. And so he used to make fun of me for chicken tenders. And he would, be, you know, they take our lunch order. They didn't even ask me. They just bring me chicken tenders. So, <laughs> so he so it's make me, you know, he called them tendy. So he, I'd be lunch. He goes, it's tendy time for you, Jared. And he, here they go. So <laughs> nice. hey, you're low maintenance. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. No. Um, there's actually a guy, one of our vendors um, has a sales rep just like that. I mean, you yeah. can go to St. Elmo's. He will try to figure out how to get chicken tenders. I'm like, dude, just order a steak. He said, no, I just want chicken tenders. So uh, uh, the funny thing, and I'll tell you that, um, that burger study right around the corner, mm-hmm. and it used, you know, it was owned by Elmo's and all those guys, yep. unfortunately stopped, but they had the best chicken tenders I've ever had, okay. believe it or not. So if you go to Izzy's at the airport, they serve them. Okay. So if you ever go there with the girls or whatever, go there a little early, right. stop, get some chicken tenders there. They're amazing. Get the honey okay. mustard with okay. them. They're pr- they're primo. So. You heard it here first, guys. Chicken tenders at Harry and Izzy's at the Indianapolis International Airport. That's right. That's right. You can't start a you can't start a trip or end a trip. Better. Sometimes I just stop there on the way, you know, I'm Coming I land in. and I'm like, "All right, I got to get some food. Sit here and have a salad in the tenders and move Be on." Be on your way. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. perfect. You, you said you got salad with it, so I mean, you're good. Yeah, that's right. right. It's life's about balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about, um, and I don't want to proceed or um, you know jump in too far, but we were talking about different car manufacturers and, and the, the series, the IMSA series that you're running now. Um, if you had of the different manufacturers that are running that, so I, you heard, I'd heard uh, Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Mercedes, McLaren. Um, there's McLarens. There's um, BMWs. Okay. There's uh, I think there's nine. There's Lexus. Um, okay. who, who else, what are the car manufacturers? There's Ford, there's Chevy, yeah. the Ford Mustang, and then the Corvette. Okay. Um, and there's a couple other ones that I don't, I don't know who else I'm missing, but Aston Martin. Okay. Um, so there's like, yeah, nine or 10 manufacturers that have, I mean, if you look, it's funny, you look at like the Ford Mustang and the thing looks like you could take it into war. It's like a tank. <laughs> it's a huge, big diffuser, big splitter, massive. And you look at the Ferrari yeah. and it looks like. It, you know, you're looking at the, you could be, lo- you're probably looking at the blue oval when you're sitting in the car and the, it's probably is where your rear view mirror comes out is probably where the blue oval is on their car. Okay. And so it's oh, like wow. so different the way that you look yeah. at, and they all have to race against each other right. under the same guidelines and rules. And yeah. So fairly even, or like I said, just differs on the year. Yeah, it, 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 it differs on the year and differs on like every year. Somebody comes out usually with an Evo kit or a new car and that's always difficult. So it, the series does as good. I mean, I don't envy them. I'm gonna be honest with you. I mean, I, it's easy to complain, but I don't envy them to getting that all right. You know, yeah. because there's so much data to go through with every car. You have yeah. four drivers in each of these cars. I mean, you have, you know, in some of these GT stuff, you have a hundred. You got hundred drivers in our class alone for Daytona, right. and then you have nine manufacturers with different tires, fuel level, all kinds of stuff. It's like. It's really hard to get right. When you did Daytona, was it two drivers or three? It's four. Four. Yeah. Okay. Twenty four hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then typically, I guess it probably varies depending on how people are feeling. What's the rotation? Yeah, it 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 does vary how people are feeling. Like and like, we had a guy get a blister this year. We had a guy hurt his ribs. So one guy that drove like a ton of the race. You know, he just the way it worked out for him. He drove a ton of the race that he wasn't otherwise slated to drive. So okay. um, yeah. it just works out differently. The other races are a lot more structured. Um, but yeah, Daytona, it's kind of, 
how how a guy's feeling, how a guy's running, things like that. You know, you have yeah. a set plan, but that plan is like, I mean, it's depends on how things are going. I mean, it's it's, it's a unravel. plan, but it's like not really a plan. <laughs> it's yeah. loose. Yeah, yeah. It's very e- evolves because you you run the race like it's going to be green the whole time, and it never runs green the whole time. Okay. So you end up cutting stints off. So what ends up is you're like you're going to be 27 stints, but you end up being like 22, okay. you know, because of the yellows. So then you end up with like, so then you cut like the last five stints off, and then you end up with okay, who's where you're going to be with who's you're going to be finishing the race for you, who's doing this, who's doing yeah. that, you know. So it's and then there's rain sometimes, and then there's guys that have experience in the rain, and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, you want them to run in the rain, yeah. and you want this or that, you know. So okay. yeah, of the different manufacturers and models that are in your class if you look at the street version the consumer version of that vehicle forgetting any contracts in place yeah which one you personally would you want to go with oh like in the street yeah i mean like i told you before like i've always had that tie to ferrari my dad and everything you know we watch formula one ferrari but my dad you know it's easy to say now you're driving a porsche but it's like he he won Daytona in a 962. He okay. drove for them in the IndyCar stuff. Like you can't beat a GT3 R, you know, on the street. So like I like the Ferrari for that tie, you know, because it's just that's yeah. the romantic brand, right? You know, you you can't beat a red Ferrari in my opinion. Yeah. But like for utility, as far as a sports car and having something that will run forever, you know, because right. Ferraris are notoriously iffy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and but the the GT3 R, you just you could drive it every day. You yeah. know, and it's not like a Lamborghini or McLaren or any of these other things where it's, you know, it's it's built to last. Mm-hmm. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll just put in my order now. But yeah, I think you have to wait three right. years or something to get one. And they're they're cheaper. The the, oh, the yeah. Porsches are cheaper. Relatively yeah. speaking, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're yeah. yeah, I mean I didn't say they're cheap, they're cheaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean I got built one recently and it was like three hundred something grand, but I was like and that's a obviously ton of cash but i was looking at and you're like you look at the ferrari and like the base model is this was like souped up this was like yeah. all the cool all stuff the, all the kit all, everything yeah three yeah. 350 and then like you yep. get like a and but the nice thing about the porsches is not to put the sales pitch same thing <laughs> ferrari but if you buy a gt3r you can sell it the next year or a year and a half and make money on it and just buy another one mm. so it's, it's like that whole racket where you can you right. know but if you get the right ferrari you buy it for half a million and it's worth a million instantly and so, but to get an allocation, you have to spend five million with them right. to get yeah. to that point, to get, you yeah. know. But it's it's n- not money that I have, nor will probably ever have. So I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, but, <laughs> I heard it. Yeah. Well, it's, maybe hey, we, we we all pull our money together, then we'll. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That um, should be close maybe. enough. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We'll yeah. Be fine. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get rolling. thing on hey guys welcome back to another episode of the summits podcast thank you all for joining us from wherever you get your podcasts or if you're joining us on the heroes foundation youtube channel thank you for doing so while you're on there if you haven't hit the subscribe button or that little notification bell icon please do so it won't cost you the same price as a new porsche ferrari we promise it's absolutely free um, today, if you haven't figured it out by now, we are joined by Mr. Jarrett Andre. Jarrett, welcome to the Summits Podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate yeah, it. You're welcome. Um, why don't we get into, we were talking about racing a little bit there, but let's go back to the where, where it all started. Give us a little background intro on yourself. Yeah, so, um, so I was born here in Indy, um, and then I moved to Charlotte, and I uh, moved to Charlotte because my dad was racing cup cars down there. So I grew up in Charlotte and went to school there, went to NC State. And then moved back to Indy to, to continue racing in 20, probably 2014, 2015. And then I've kind of been here ever since. But I do like to travel quite a bit. And uh, I grew up in the South. And so these winters are not, um, <laughs> these last couple of days would have been whatever, you know, right, 60s. Yeah. That's kind of like the kind of winter that I'm accustomed to. And if it gets below freezing in Charlotte, it's kind of, you know, it's it's mayhem. Yeah, you know? And down. so here it's like, you know, when you get in and it's minus three or something like that, or feels like minus 10, it's... Um, it's time for me to head south. Yeah. So I actually had to go to Chicago a month or so ago. I mean, it was cold here. It's only three hours away. But I roll in, and there's one of those billboards that shows, you know, the time and temperature or whatever, and it was minus nine. Yeah. And so I got to our office. I got out of the car. And I was like, 
cold. Like I know I'm getting older, but like yeah, that was freaking that was cold. cold. There is yeah. something about like that um that Chicago, and I know they call it the Windy City, but then and then they have the lake in Cleveland, and yep. then you in like Wisconsin, like that extra hour north to Milwaukee or that Cleveland. Like mm-hmm. I've been in there and been to those places in the winter, and I'm like. It, it feels totally di- – it feels like it goes through you. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I was just going to yeah. say, we, yeah. you already had the air temperature of minus 9. It was, you know, naturally breezy up there. Yeah. And to your point, like, you felt like just that breeze coming through was going right through your coat. Yeah. Like, you're, yeah. It was awful. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Uh, NC State, what was what was your major in college? Uh, business administration. Um, at that point in time, you, had, you were probably go-karting and doing some other racing, I assume. Yeah, I was racing sprint cars here. So I was okay. actually uh, I was actually driving, me and my dad. I drive from, um, so we, my dad and my mom uh, lived in Charlotte with my sisters. So I drive the two and a half hours to Raleigh. I would do uh, okay. classes Monday through Wednesday. I drive back to Charlotte on Wednesday. We'd drive overnight to Indy, me and my dad, and then we would race, um, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then drive back and go to school. So there was a lot of times I was rolling into class on Monday having raced on sunday night and then i would just just go right into class like i would just park and go straight to class and it was like you know like i was racing dirt sprint cars at the time so you're still like you know i'm like totally cooked i'm you know half asleep or (laughs) fully asleep and (laughs) trying to like you know you know it's attendance so you have to be there and so yeah so that was that was a fun that was a fun couple years i I did have a blast it was a good time me and my dad spent a lot of windshield time together i'm sure you know with what transpired the next couple of years, obviously that, that time even means even more now. For sure. Yeah. 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 At that point in time, so you're, you know, 18 to 22 ish. Um, did you think that this was going to be your career path like, or you, you wanted it to be, um, certainly I would, I would, just, I would assume, um, at what point did you kind of make the decision? Hey, yeah, I, I want to get into racing like legitimately. Yeah. I think, I think what we started, I did kind of did a couple go-kart things when I was in high school with my dad. He came off the road, and then it was kind of like we kind of got our sprint car built, and then we started to race that in Indiana, and it was kind of like, all right, we're going to do this. And then you kind of just build your life around that is wanting to race. And, you know, you don't really think about when you're 18, 19, you don't really think about too far ahead of your – you know, it's kind of like let's just – I just want to go racing, so mm-hmm. let's just race yeah. as much as we can. And we ran sprint cars, and so I, I built my whole life around that, and I graduated early from school so I could, I could move to Indy. So I moved, I I zipped up, I had a bag that I lived out of since the moment I left home at 18 and I zipped it back up and went, moved in with family down here after I graduated in December after the new year and took care of the sprint car program and um, built cars and stuff like that. And then I never, I never unpacked that bag for like 10 years until I finally bought my house here. So I remember when I unpacked that bag for the first, you know, that, that time I was, Oh wow, this is where everything finally gets to stay, you know? And so, um, so that was, you know, that's, I'm not going to say it was like, Oh yeah, we're definitely gonna, but it was just like, let's just race as much as we can and let's Mm -hmm. just keep racing and keep talking to people and keep getting sponsors and keep everybody happy and let's just see where it takes us. Yeah. Yeah. Your dad did a variety of racing from IndyCar to NASCAR um, and probably a whole lot of other things that I'm not, I'm not even aware of, but was there any, that probably shaped maybe your interest, I would think, but like, was there any particular path that you wanted to go down or was it just like, hey, I, I'll race whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think that there wasn't really anything. And I got into racing pretty late. Uh, okay. I mean, I was 17, almost 18 at that okay. point. And so there's a okay. lot of kids that were, I mean, you see guys now, they're, driving Indy cars or Formula, I mean, Verstappen was 16, 17 yeah, driving right. a Formula One car. So okay. it's like, you know, I, it was really not like a structured anything. It, it's been totally unstructured. That's how his career was. Yeah. He just kind of drove whatever he could whenever he got a chance. And then that's kind of how my, my career has taken me. It's kind of gone different places, different areas, different cars, lots of different people. And mm-hmm. so it, it, it's never been like I've never had the luxury of saying I want to do this and I'm going to do this. Right. It was always just been like, oh yeah, that sounds fun. Let's do that, you yeah. know, and that makes okay. sense. So then, based on the mix of experience so far, what has been your favorite thing to drive, and maybe your least favorite thing to drive? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I really enjoyed the sprint cars, just racing okay. as much as we did here in Indiana. I mean, you race sixty times a year. You would race, it's you know, you go. Yeah, it was a lot of time, and you would go. I mean, it was fun. Years with me and my dad, when we would just race however we wanted, we'd race two or three nights a week, and then we would just say, okay. We'd always have, like, a guy with us, and we'd be like, all right, Friday night, it looks like rain. We're going to race up north, but 
there's no rain down south, we'll just turn the trailer down south and go racing, you know. Yeah. Or there are some times where we race six, seven times in a row, six, seven nights in a row. And we would look at each other and like we were like getting ready to leave for like night six. And we he would look at me and I'd look at him and we'd just close the door and go get something to eat. We were just like, you know what? We don't you know, we were just beat, you know, yeah. this yeah. is not so it was it was fun to kind of to kind of do that, you know, okay. I mean, we could, and, but we raced a ton and, um, there's very, more often than not, we went to races where maybe we shouldn't have, cause of, it was like, it looks like rain. Well, we, we think we can make it and we'd go there and, you know, it'd rain out. Okay. never mind. We should stay <laughs> home. But, um, the sprint car was so fun just because of all that stuff and with the family and racing as much as we did. And, um, the stuff least, least favorite, um, man, it's hard. I mean, I really enjoy, I enjoy it at all, but like the, the go-kart stuff when we got into it was it's so different it's fun because it's just like r grassroots racing but the go-kart stuff is those guys were so good and they were so f it's so finicky how they have to drive the carts that it, okay. i never really got a good grasp on that because i was in i was kind of like there for like a minute and then was doing sprint car stuff so right. um so it's it, you know it does probably my this is probably my least favorite of of everything but there's still a lot of fun and it's still a blast so yeah it's like you know, the delta between cars is very small okay. of, of how much I like and how much I dislike. You know, it's True. all fun. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the base, you know, if you draw the median and it's fun, they're all above it. So right. it's, you know. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you've done a little open wheel uh, racing. What's, what, what is your, um, I guess, view of that versus the IMSA stuff? Yeah, I think the open wheel stuff, the open wheel cars are very, um, everything just takes a different driving style. And the open wheel cars, the, the, you know, you're racing against cars that are just all in your class, right? It's just yeah. all like indie cars. It's all um, indie cars or um, uh, just indie lights cars or USF mm -hmm. that whatever it is. But in like an IMSA, there's four different classes. Yeah. And so you're racing consistently wherever you're at in the traffic. You know, you might some guy. You know, we've been in the middle, and we've also been the slowest car. You know, as far as like classes. Sure. So then you're always looking at. Sometimes you're looking before, in front of you, and behind you, and then sometimes you're looking just behind you. And so right. it's very interesting how you have to play that traffic, play that strategy. So it, that's been really it, that's enjoyable. So yeah, I would. I mean, I have no experience with it, but I would think what you just described. I mean, your head's pretty much on a swivel because on one hand you're focused on trying to pass whoever's in front of you, but then. If there are other classes that are much more uh, more powerful, you're like, okay, I also need to watch for the guys coming up behind me, so I don't botch yeah. them or take myself out, but right? Get in their way or whatever. And also, you want to use them to help you get around the guy in front of you. Oh, so yeah. you have to. You, it's like, okay, so you're like, you want them to pass you strategically, where you lose as little time as possible, but you want him to put the next guy in a bad situation. Right. You mm -hmm. know, you never want anybody to get crashed, but you want somebody to be like, okay. If I let him go here, kind of draft behind him somehow I, or something. Yeah, and sometimes you just like okay, you get to a corner and you just you let you're able to let him go, and you want to let him go because he would cost you more time at the next corner, hoping that he gets to the next guy and costs him twice as much time as he's cost you. So there's yeah, a okay. there's a strategy with everything with all that stuff, um, and then sometimes you have you don't you sometimes you're like no, this, you just have to block and say okay this would cost me more time. Yep. And he just needs to be patient, you know, yeah. so, so you, it's a give and take and you, you try to, you know, in those situations you want to, you want, you take at the end of the race. You don't, you don't take early in the race. Right. So how many, degree. how many cars are on the track in, in that Usually series? 60 plus. 60 plus. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's crazy. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of cars, there's a lot of traffic, a lot yeah. of, it's very, very different than what, and the, the, the nice thing about IMSA is like an IndyCar cup cars any single make series there's there's races throughout the field mm -hmm. but there's only one race for the lead and if somebody's running away with it that's kind of the end of the race right yeah and in imsa there's four classes so it's like oh the the class the race in gtp is no good let's look at p2 or let's look at gtd pro or gtd and let's look at you know so you're going to find a race for the lead usually in traffic somewhere Moment. in the thing so you're yeah. gonna look at some finish it's gonna be like neck and deck and yeah. i mean the finishes this year were all neck and neck i think in ev almost every class oh, that's cool wow. and it, so it's like y there's action everywhere it's not like one of those things where you know you're like guys leading by four seconds in a cup race and you're like this is nothing's gonna Silver happen because yeah. even in the imsa stuff a guy could be leading you catch traffic wrong two or three times you catch traffic at the bus stop as a gtp car you catch it into turn one or something like that you can lose two or three seconds like that right. and the guy's right back on you so it's really that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah. so it's 
the racing is so good. Yeah. IMSA now races regularly at IMS, correct? Yeah, they've start they've added the schedule. It starts uh, started last year and goes this year as well. Okay, okay. when is that this year? Do you so know? it's September twentieth through the twenty second. Okay. Um, it's a six hour endurance race, which is really cool. Oh, okay. And the the big thing they're pushing now is um you can park and camp in the infield. So you don't oftentimes get to do that, I guess. And okay. um, so that's really cool. So yeah. what a better place to, to wake up and watch, see the pagoda and right. and be woken up by race cars. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to have to go out and take a look at yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Try that That'd out. Pretty cool. Are you guys planning on being in that? I yeah. Assume? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That'll be fun. Well, Jared, we've talked, I know you and I chatted before um, about this and you, you alluded to your experiences with your dad at growing up and mm-hmm. doing all the races and, and to your point, those experiences are huge and stuff that uh, certainly even have more meaning today. Um, what is what is your guys' cancer story? Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think that's kind of all here what right Unite says. And unfortunately, more often than not, you're going to find somebody that's got a story. You could probably go to anybody yeah. on the street and say, "Hey, what what have you what have you dealt with with this?" and um, and they're going to have a story. So you know, unfortunately, you know, every you know, mine hits close to home. Obviously, with my father, you know, he got you know diagnosed with colorectal cancer at 2017 he's 53 years old didn't get a colonoscopy early enough you know his primary care doctor was not um told him oh yeah you're fine you're fine and you're healthy right you're fine and you know they call it the silent killer for a reason yeah and um unfortunately didn't get one um and uh at 53 got diagnosed and you know he fought it tooth and nail for three years and, and it, you know, it did, it went very quickly from stage two, stage three, stage four, which, you know, metastasized from the colon to the liver and to, you know, other places. Mm-hmm. And, um, so when, you know, when that happens, uh, you know, he's, you know, you're fighting with chemo and you have the chemo and the surgeries and all the other stuff that goes along with it. Right. I think he did over 30 rounds of chemo. He did multiple yeah. surgeries. You know, I can't even, I can't, I lost count, honestly, he did clinical trials, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, he fought to the, to the very end, yeah. which is what you'd expect from, from a race car driver, sure, right? Yeah. You know, it was, yeah. it was, you know, you never, he's like, I only, he, he always tell me, he's like, I only need them to find the cure the day before I die. He's like, so if I can get one True more story. day out of it, one more day. Yep. And I was like, you know, it's, I like, that's a good mentality. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, with the clinical trial, he said, you know, if he would always like, I, I want to be part of us. If I can help be part of the solution, then that's, you know, that, that gives, that gives it more, you know, more meaning, right. Mm-hmm. You know, he wanted to, maybe if it wasn't going to help him directly, if it could help somebody else, that was, and I think yeah. that's the whole genesis and basis of the foundation, right. You know, it's, it's like, unfortunately he's gone and from our lives, but if we can use the foundation, the respect that he had in the community, the name, and the goodwill that he's built up mm-hmm. to not only drive awareness, but also donate colonoscopies and all, you know, actually not just awareness campaigns, we, but be boots on the ground and actually yep. donating and delivering colonoscopies um, and paving the way for people that otherwise wouldn't get one, you know, right. that want one, need one, but can't get one. Sure. Yeah. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting your dad. Um, I don't remember what year it was. He was definitely in the midst of his battle. Uh, this kind of tells you about what kind of a guy uh, John Andretti was. So we just and there was a bunch of people around. So it was kind of small talk, but um, it was he, he went, directly wanted to go into what we were doing relative to the pediatric side, what we were doing for mm-hmm. kids yeah. um, who were in the hospital with cancer, despite everything that he was going through yeah. and how you could tell he was not feeling the greatest, um, but was more interested in, in what you know what we're doing for to help other people. That's that's pretty telling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was, that was him. Yeah, that was him. And, um, and that's why he was, he was obviously very big, he's a big supporter of Riley, um, mm-hmm. over the years. And, um, and so that, that's been, you know, that was his way of giving back to the community. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he wanted to, he always wanted to help. And I think that's, he was very private and, but he was like, you know, keeping this to myself is not, doesn't really do anybody any good other than me. Right, because I don't want to have I don't want to have the conversation everywhere I go, but it got to a point where it, it was you know he realized how much good he was making you know was doing mm-hmm. right. We'd be at a at a race, and I was telling the story a couple of days ago. You know, you'd be at a race, sprint car race, caught Kokomo, and somebody from the stands would go, "Hey, John, just got my colonoscopy." You know, and you're, it's just mm-hmm. funny where it's like 
10 years ago, nobody would have ever said that, right? right? Yeah. You know what I mean? But it was like, you know, it might be some big guy with a beard with a big beer in his hand <laughs> and, you know, hey, I just got my colonoscopy, you know, so it's breaking down the stigmatism of that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's something everybody needs to get done. You know, it's 45 now, and if you have family history or you have other problems, it needs to be sooner. It needs to be right. on everybody's health check because it's preventable, right? So, mm-hmm. um, but it, so those things were good. And then he would, you know, we would chuckle, right? We would laugh because, you know, people would just in, in every day, it might be at Applebee's or something like that, eating dinner. And someone said, hey, John, just got my colonoscopy. Well, <laughs> that's great. Maybe don't want to hear about it right now. <laughs> no. But, yeah. you know, that was, I, I appreciate, hey, maybe I just went and got screened, you know? Yeah, but, yeah, you know, you go, yeah. But <laughs> it was funny how people would be so excited to, to tell him. You oh, know, that's good. So. I mean, to your point, that it's that's progress for sure. Yeah. It it is it is so and um, yeah. So for me, it's been normal. I've never had. There's been no stigma around it for me, right? Obviously, I've gotten one, and I need to get one this year, as a matter of fact. And um, yeah, so you know, we talk about it all the time, and I know right. probably way more about prep kits and fit tests <laughs> and and all that stuff than right. I ever thought I'd ever know. But yeah. you know, that's that's so you know. That's where life takes you, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Um, So let's shift into what you guys are doing. Um, Yeah. We talked to a lot of people about who, who take the emotion of a situation and turn it into action. What are you guys doing? Yeah. So we had a, uh, you know, we had a individual and we had been kicking around the idea of the foundation. um, And um, we had an individual um, who donates every year, really, really nice guy. He has a company in, uh, in Pennsylvania and he called me after, um, my dad's um, service in Indianapolis, and I remember it was a it was a it was a day like yesterday where it was like rainy and kind of crappy, mm-hmm. and I was driving back from the gym, and um, he was like, "Hey, Jared, um, what are you gonna do for the foundation?" I said, "Well, it's really an awareness campaign. Me and dad and mom never really discussed exactly like what steps or anything like that because my dad didn't say, "Hey, you got to do this or anything like that." He was kind of like, you know, it's awareness campaign. You know, that's mm-hmm. cool, and um, he was like, "No, you don't understand." I have a check. I need you to do something with it. And I said, um, understood. So I'll, I got it. Message received. I'll go talk to my mom. And so I came home and talked to my mom. She was at my house with all the girls. And um, I said, hey, this guy said, and she goes, I've been thinking we need to do something with that. So, um, so it, at, you know, obviously that was early 2020. Mm-hmm. That was probably f- February. Okay. So it's like we had a lot of time to work on it. Um, yeah. because we all, about right. a month later, we were all sitting back at home and, um, my aunt Carolyn, who's my dad's older sister, she's an attorney. She did the 501c3 application. Yeah. Um, and we got it in November. Luckily for us with her, she was an attorney, very diligent, did it, no mistakes, no problems, went right through. So we were like, you know, you, you have these little times where it's like, you feel like you got a little help, right? Because everybody was st- starting stuff at that sure. point, right? Because they didn't have anything else. So, hey, you know, I want to start this project. I'm at home. I'm working from home. Right. Yeah. Not a lot busy. And it just went straight through. So in November, we got our designation, which would have been November 2020. We spent, um, spent a year trying to figure out, okay, how do we... So now we have, you know, our number. Mm-hmm. We've got no dollars, no money. And we've got um, no way of getting colonoscopies to people. So you are uh, you got to start a business, basically. And you're like, okay, how do we raise funds? We had a lot of people chip in. Um, and we have um, a roundup campaign going with our carding centers. So you go to the carding centers. Okay. So we have six Andretti Indoor Carding and Games, um, two in Atlanta, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, and Orlando. They do a roundup campaign. We're opening up one in Arizona actually next week. Yeah, cool. And um, – They've been a steady flow of, you know, of help. We've we've built the endowment. We've done all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know how we're getting the colonoscopies to people because you know we, it's it's harder to give away stuff than you actually than you expect. Believe it or not, and I'm sure you found that out. You know, and you're trying to give stuff to people, um, and you have to go through the right channels. So we found a doctor. Um, and now we have multiple doctors that mm-hmm. bought onto the mission. Actually, Dr. Patel, who did my colonoscopy and Northeast Digestive. And then we have Dr. Corapati, um in Rowan County now. But we have um, – and um, so those – Dr. Patel was the first one in. He donated 10 free of charge. We paid for everything else remainder, and he gave us a set price. And we just – and so we tied it into the free and charitable clinic in that area. And they have people that – anybody that comes in there is 300% below the poverty line. So they come in, go to the direct primary care. They think, oh, we might need a colonoscopy. They do a fit test, do the fit test. 
if it comes back positive, for sure you have to go do that. But if it doesn't, um, if you still think you need one, still goes over there. So the foundation has no, we just pay. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, well, I'm not a doctor, obviously. And I don't want to tell who doesn't. I just want to raise money right, yeah. and try mm -hmm. to get colonoscopies to people. So we're very lucky now because um, in addition to that, we've got a fit test partner called Polymedco that donates fit tests. And then we have okay. a prep partner called Sabella Pharmaceuticals. So we have these people that are also helping us. So we can go to any, you know, anybody who's watching this has a free and charitable clinic and a GI doctor. We have, you know, a way to help. have a way to help. We have fit yeah. tests, we have prep kits, and we have, you know, a way to try to try to help with colonoscopies um, with financial support. So we have that, and we've done fi over 50 so far. Nice. And we're working on, I can see the momentum growing and building. It's just like we're very close on getting, and I think we're going to start taking big, big chunks mm -hmm. out right. of that. So um, at least that's what I hope. I hope I don't come back in a year and go, well, I've done, you know, I hope I get a couple of those over the line. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Um, how do people find out more about that? Just go check it for Andretti.org. And okay. you can learn about my dad's story. You can learn about our partners. You can learn about all that stuff. Um, so, is it the number four or F O R? Uh, number four. Number four. Yep. So that's that's how we do. Um, that's the best place to go. The Twitter account and Instagram account. The, sorry, the Instagram account is very active. So if you want to go there, okay. that, that does a great job. Yeah. Much more active than like mine and you know some of the other stuff so they <laughs> they do a good job um and my mom's in charge of it you know i have to give her all the credit i mean i don't she's very much batman and i'm very much robin and i try to yep. just help and do whatever she doesn't want to do mm -hmm. and um and so she's she's the lead on that so she's done a great job got the website up and running and so it's been it's been really cool it's been yeah. it yeah. started from literally just n the, like this us sitting around going i think we should do this right you know? so that's cool and it's yeah. amazing when you start to do something, you start to pull on the rope, how many people start to join you. And you look around and they got 40 people pulling on the rope with you. You're going, oh, man, this is really, right. this is really, and we have more than that. Anybody that's donated via the carding centers, they're on the, they're on that side of the rope with us. So, right. yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it takes a village, as they say. Yeah, definitely yeah. does. Well, Mama Andretti, good job. Good for you on that. Again, they got, guys, let's check it for the number four, andretti.org. Take a look uh, at the website, join uh, or follow them on Instagram. Um, they would appreciate that very much, and so would we. Um, all right, so we've, we've covered chicken tenders or tendies, <laughs> IMSA, and yeah. the different manufacturers uh, within that. Obviously, uh, your cancer story and what you guys are doing there, mm -hmm. really missed. What's, uh, what's, what does the future look like for you after IMSA? Or what's the is there a next series you're interested in, or...? I I don't think so. I think IMSA is really, it's growing immensely year after year. I mean, year over year, we're getting 25% bumps in attendance. I mean, this was the yeah. highest attended Rolex 24 ever. So um, so I, I think IMSA is a great place to be. Um, the schedule is great. It's 10 races. You do some testing. Um, you know, with everything else that's going on, doing more is probably difficult for me, you know, because yeah. I, I, you know, you do want to dedicate time to the foundation and things like that. So, um, I really like IMSA and I really like the racing here and racing in the States and racing close to home. So it's nice to, you know, there's three or four races that I can just drive to. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that, that helps a lot. Yeah. So what, uh, you said the attendance at Daytona was the highest they've had mm -hmm. in either forever or in a while. What, what do they attribute that to? Honestly, I think it's because, um, a lot of people have sports car racing. It's been getting more and more popular, but mm -hmm. um, where I think sports car racing reaches a better demographic is the accessibility for fans. Mm. So like there's so many dads with their daughter, son, kids in strollers and they're coming and they're looking in. Those are the cars that they see in, you know, whatever it is, Need for Speed or Gran Turismo or whatever sure. it is, right? They're all the, and they get to go see a Lamborghini up close and they get to see, and mm -hmm. you go, there's a grid walk, so free grid walk. So you go to the grid walk, yeah. they can get up close and personal, all the cars. They That's come in the garage, get up close and personal with all the cars and teams. The access is unprecedented for what, it's like drag racing, you know, it's that yeah. sports cars and drag racing to get that much, that mm -hmm. much access. And IMSA has done a great job reaching the younger demographic, which you know it is, Vince, if it's, if you can take and you say, hey, Sydney, we want to do this, but we, and we can take the kids. Right. Or hey, it's got to be just us two. It's a whole. It, you're 50 percent or 
<laughs> less likely to do the one that's just you guys Correct. than yep. everything else, right? Because yeah. you want to. You get your your free time is valuable. And you want to spend it with your your dogs. Right. That's just the way it goes. Yep. And yep. you can go to the races inexpensively, your whole family, and say this is what we're going to do. And the cool thing is, is you see a lot of you know there might be people that they get a hotel in Daytona, and the wife might stay back with the daughter, but then the dad and the son come back at two in the morning, you know, oh, or three okay. in the morning or four sure. in the morning, and they get to spend some time together. It might be the daughter, you right, know, and, yeah. and so it's really that's what's really cool is to see the fans just they kind of grow up in the sport and then they don't leave because they get all these different cars and mm-hmm. whatever cl- you know they have different prototypes and different gt cars and all kinds of cool stuff right. and so i get two questions one is as a driver with the fan accessibility do you like it i mean i guess i could see where maybe it has, might have some issues but is that something that energizes you guys or excites you guys at all it, or it, it's really cool so when i st- first started doing imsa it was at the beginning of 2021, and I raced uh, all 2020 with no fans, obviously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so beginning of 20, and then I went to, we did like two races, I think, and then we went to the Glen, and that was the first time that they really opened it up. Okay. Ironically, it was in New York, which um, I don't know how they got that done, but <laughs> props to IMSA. And, um, <laughs> but went there, and they had the fan walk, and that was the first, and I was like, oh my, look at all these people, you know? And right. then... It was so cool because you used to just, you know, you hear the national anthem and you look around and there's there's nobody there, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. And you're like, oh, no, this is like a, yeah, this is a, when the people are there, it, it does add to it. Yeah. And you see all the fans and you see, and sometimes you see people, now we start to see people year after year at the same places. And they're, I'm like, I remember you. And they're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I come to this race every year. So it's kind of funny to see that. Sure. And um, so it is awesome to have the fans, the, the fans there. And you don't really... A pr- you didn't really get to appreciate it until they weren't there. Yeah. yeah. And then you say, then you come back and you're like, oh, this is really cool. You right. Know? Certainly there's times when you're like trying to go to the bathroom and there's a horde of people and you can't get to the bathroom. There's certainly, there's certainly some frustrations <laughs> at some points, but it's like, yeah. yeah, that's pretty minor in the grand scheme of how, right. how cool it is to have all the people there. Yeah. And you see them too. Two years ago, Daytona, it was like freezing. I mean, it was, literally like 32 at night mm. and you look up and people are in blankets they have fires they have the big fire pits and i'm like you guys are nuts like <laughs> and, but that's so cool to have that and right. you know see that so yeah yeah that's cool i've not i don't think i've ever been to an imsa race i need to go for mm-hmm. sure go to the one in september yeah. at, at ims but um i'm wondering if if the attraction now is that you obviously the cars you're racing are not street cars clearly but the identity with the manufacturers are cars that people somewhat regularly see, to, so to speak, mm-hmm. versus in any, I mean, you're not going to see an Indy car on Meridian Street out here. <laughs> um, does that maybe draw some people yes. in too? Because there's some level of familiarity, yeah. maybe? There, it 100% does. And also, there's a lot of car clubs. Like you have the Porsche Car Club, the, sure, sure. the Corvette Corral, yeah. the this. And it's everybody, they come in and they connect with other like-minded people that own cars like theirs mm-hmm. and they have certain areas where they can park okay the porsche club can park here here's all the spots you come in you watch the, the porsches run you cheer for them yeah. same with corvettes and bmws and all the other stuff so yeah so it's it's kind of one of those things where you they come in and they are cheering for the car that they have in their garage yeah. and it's different too because it's like an indy car or nascar usually guys get tied to a driver Mm-hmm. Right, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. where these guys get tied to a car, a brand, a manufacturer, yep. which is which is cool, which is great. You know, it's fantastic. It's like you know, I want, I just want to see a Porsche, a BMW, whatever win, and um, so yeah, there's definitely that tie, and yeah. you can. I mean, the cars that that we race, you can. I mean, as a if you have obviously enough cash, you can buy one and you can go out and take it as a track day car. You know, so you can they they can sell you those types of things. Yeah, it's not a street car. And it's an expensive track day car, but if you <laughs> if you want to do that, you can do that, and you can actually say, "Oh, I have one of these at whatever motor club, Monticello, Thermal, whatever," and I get to test it, and I know what it's like to drive this car. Which yeah. you're never going to f- see a fan yeah. typically that says, "Hey, I drove an Indy car at you know what I mean, yeah. or a Cup yeah. car, yeah. right?" So, yeah. so sometimes it's you know, it you have that additional interaction as well. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. So you're saying there's a chance. There's a, there's there's definitely very small a chance. chance, but there's very a chance. slim, very slim. You know, you just need you just need to hit the lottery the day before they stop selling. It's yeah, just like exactly. my dad. Yeah, exactly. Find well the day before. Well played, and, and that's what it's going to take too. 
All right, cool. Well, Jarrett, thank you for taking yeah, the time out you. and joining us. Thanks for sharing your story. We appreciate it. We're very happy with what you guys are doing. Keep mm -hmm. it up. Um, if there's any way we can assist and, and help push that uh, that message out, we're happy to do so. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. appreciate you guys having me on. And, um, yeah, thank you. We'll see yeah. you in September. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. See you. And thank all you guys for tuning into this episode of the Summits Podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts or if you join us on the Heroes Foundation YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. Don't forget, guys, beat cancer.